um, we started on the idea of this program um, when we started hearing about the uh, Burns series um, because there was some concerns about how that would be, how that would represent what the Vietnam War and the aftermath. And um, we were particularly concerned because um, we fear that we are very much repeating some of the same mistakes. So uh, today we have several panelists and we'll sort of base our presentation in some things about the Vietnam War, but then we're moving on to current um, problems and issues and um, take a look at, um, hopefully, some ideas about what we can do about that. So um, let me briefly introduce the panelists. Um, at the far end is George Wicks, um, who was in the first of the Burns series. How many of you actually saw some or all of the Burns series? Quite a few, yes. So you may recognize him. He was in the first one as an OSS officer at the end of World War II when he went into Vietnam and actually met with Ho Chi Minh. Um, and next to him is Chuck Hunt, who uh, was uh, got a conscientious objection objector status at 18 with the Selective Service and has been a very much an anti-war activist uh, and member of SDS, uh, re fairly recently retired from the University of Oregon as a, an instructor in sociology. Marion Malcolm, Mary Malcolm has, is a long time key peace activist, social justice activist here in uh, Eugene and Lane County. And then Mike Peterson, a Marine in the Vietnam War, um, was in, had two tours, 68 to 70. Uh, and Bruce Hendricks, as uh, also a, the, an Army veteran, with a tour in 1970. And as he said, when he got back, he was too young to even legally drunk, drink. So, um, yeah. So, and that statement says a lot. Ken Burns had a preview of this film series in Portland last month. And he spoke a little bit afterward. And at one point, he asked all the veterans to stand. And the audience applauded. Then he asked all the anti-war protesters to stand. And the audience applauded. But the striking thing is that most of those who stood up the first time stood up the second time. And I think uh, these are sentiments that are shared by many people who were in Vietnam. Now, I'm not really a Vietnam vet because I arrived in Vietnam on September 4th, 1945. Yeah. Right after the armistice, I was in the OSS. I was in the Army and serving in the OSS. And OSS sent teams to the capital cities of Southeast Asia. I was in Rangoon when the war ended. I was supposed to jump into Thailand, but luckily the war ended in time for me. And for everyone, of course. Uh, and I heard that the <coughs> commanding officer going to Saigon was coming through, so I went and interviewed him. And I told him I had uh, studied the language. Uh, the Army had sent me to Berkeley to study what is now called Vietnamese. He was totally unimpressed. <laughs> he said, yes, but can you speak French? <laughs> I said, uh, this will surprise you, French is my first language. All right, he said, what is the French word for street? I said, rue. He said, you can go. <laughs> so I was there. My CO was killed, by the way, uh, <clears throat> later that month. This is September 1945. He had had an in incredible war. He'd been in North Africa, first of all, with the Free French. 
Well, he'd been with the Polish army to begin with, even before joining the U.S. Army. And then when he was with the U.S. Army, he, he uh, was with the Free French in North Africa. Then he joined OSS and he jumped into occupied France with a small team, made contact with the uh, <coughs> French resistance fighters. They captured a German staff car and drove around in it for a while and sent back all kinds of important intelligence just at the moment when the invasion was taking place in the south of France. I mention all this because he was killed in Vietnam. Ironically, a tragic mistake, they took him for a Frenchman. Now, he and I were meeting with some of the leaders of the what later became known as the Viet Minh, the independence movement against French colonial occupation. For a long time, there had been a lot of resistance to the French, and the Vietnamese saw this as an opportunity to get rid of the French, to get their own country back. OSS had a team in Hanoi and a team in Saigon, small group in each case. And in Hanoi particularly, they were meeting regularly with Ho Chi Minh and were generally in support of the independence movement. Now we all felt Ho Chi Minh wanted desperately to get in touch with this country and we all felt that <clears throat> there was no need for the U.S. to get involved at all. And so it's understandable that uh, anyone who did get involved from this country would eventually see the error of our ways. And <clears throat> I think I'll stop there, but if there are any questions about those early days, I'd be glad to talk about that. I think we'll talk and then question. Hello, I'm Mike, Mike Peterson. I'd like to read a statement <laughs> first um, about uh, Mel Gertov and torture. I thought when I got back from Vietnam, we were fighting the war in all the wrong ways. For example, the grunts, both the Army and the Marines, fought the uh, war largely in terms of search and destroy. That usually meant the destruction of the Vietnamese hamlets along with the Viet Cong North Vietnamese Army. If we waged our war in rather than on the hamlets, things might be different. That was before I met Mel Gertov. Mel Gertov, when he was history professor at UC Riverside, fundamentally changed my mind. The Vietnam War was basically unwinnable at least from America's perspective at the time. Basically, we were fighting on the wrong side. Indeed, we were the wrong side. All this despite our having a number of, quote, allies, unquote, usually an odd assortment of members of the old French colonial administration, to a large number of Catholics we had shipped in U.S. transports from the North Vietnam to South Vietnam, to members of the Hua Hao, a formerly criminal organization, I regret not having him here at the Eugene Public Library to respond. He was originally scheduled to appear in a similar function at the U of O. But I'd like mainly to talk about torture and my experiences with same. I was squad leader of a combined action platoon. The program was focused around a squad of Marines teamed with one Navy corpsman, teamed with a platoon of the popular forces, the lowest of the low of the government of South Vietnam and their army of the Republic of Vietnam. The PFs served at the behest of the district chief, in our case, one Major Dao of Hung Thuy District, and were unpaid. One key advantage of the popular forces was this. They operated in their own hamlets or neighboring hamlets and knew who the enemy was, or maybe for reasons of their own, chose not to reveal who the enemy was. The structure of the Nia Quan, as the term is known in Vietnamese, was simple. You had the trung chi, or sergeant, and everyone else patrolling the hamlet 24-7. But getting back to torture. 
Strictly speaking, I never tortured, but I allowed some Marines assigned to me to participate in the soap treatment. Twice, when I should have forbidden it and told them to knock it off. It was to be a strictly Vietnamese affair, to say the least. The soap treatment, the soap treatment as you may or may not know, was a primitive form of what we now know as waterboarding. The victim was held down and soap lathered into his or her mouth and nose, causing that individual to gag and swallow soap, along with the struggle to breathe. We were assured that the torture was ultimately harmless and had no lasting damage, at least physically, was done. I now realize it was all bullshit. Trung Yu Tong, in his Viet Cong memoir, relates how his gastrointestinal tract was permanently screwed up, causing him to seek ongoing treatment. You can imagine the struggle it is simply to breathe. If not, I did it myself while I was in the shower. I held a washcloth and, uh, uh, over my face, lathered it, exhaled, and tried to be breathe. I was mostly surprised at the suddenness of it all. I was literally gasping for breath within seconds. I immediately put the washcloth down and gulped for breath. Imagine a snot-nosed 20-year-old kid holding that kind of power. One of the worst feelings you can have is that you realize that you can no longer be sure of what you are capable or what you would or would not do. Now imagine Donald Trump when he routinely spoke of torture throughout his campaign. Under his scenario, such forms of torture would, would be the entry point on a long, increasingly painful path, both psychologically and physically, a path ending in God knows where to what ending purpose God only knows. And incidentally, God does not permit this to happen. We permit this to happen. As Sasha Abramsky reported in the October 9th issue of The Nation, and I quote, here was a man vying for the highest office in the United States who wanted to turn into a moral good to romanticize acts of savage violence that for hundreds of years had been regarded as beyond the democratic pale. This truly was the banality of evil described by the philosopher Hannah Arendt. But for all the bravado, the reality TV star turned presidential candidate never actually got down and dirty and explained to his audiences, especially those people in the military, exactly what he would be asking them to do when, as president and commander in chief, he authorized the torture and a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Along with the soap treatment or waterboarding, would he make them dismember ISIS recruits limb from limb? Would he order them to uh, impale suspects slowly on spikes? Would he order psychiatrists to break the minds of dissidents and terrorists as Soviet medics did under Stalin? Would he order soldiers to throw young men and women out of helicopters and airplanes into the ocean as Argentina's military dictators did in the 1970s and 80s? Or would he ask them to force confessions out of suspects like the rogue police unit on Chicago's south side that I wrote about in the 1990s? by tying them to scalding hot radiators, by mock executing them, or by using Vietnam era telephone torture in which electrodes are clipped to the victim's genitals and a wind-up device like a field telephone is then cranked to deliver devastating electric shocks. Like I said earlier, one of the worst things you can have, one of the worst feelings you can have is that you realize that you can no longer be sure of what you are capable or things that you would or would not do. I rest my case. Not so easy to follow. I'm Marion Malcolm, and I started working for Calc in 1974 when it was still clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. And I think it's a heritage we can certainly be glad to claim. I think I want to start by answering the question that was posed in the publicity for the event, are we making the same mistakes, and then work backwards to some of my own experiences. So yes, we are making the same mistakes. Our leaders are making the same mistakes. And I have a one sentence summary about why, and it's this. When you're somewhere that you shouldn't be, no good can come of it. 
That's simplistic, but it's true, I think. True in Vietnam, true in Iraq, true in Afghanistan, where the U.S. has now been engaged for a very long time. In Afghanistan, as in Vietnam, the U.S. intervened without an invitation from any legitimate force and has been propping up a corrupt government which does not enjoy popular support. It cannot end well, and it needs to be labeled as aggression. At the beginning of the burns Novik vietnam series, we're told there's no single truth in war. And of course, that's true from the perspective of individual experiences. But I think that there is a simple, overarching truth, and that is this. American involvement in Vietnam was wrong. I don't buy the burns Novik introductory proposal that people of goodwill made mistakes based in misunderstandings. I think there's plenty of evidence that the U.S. first aided and then took over from the French because our government was not willing to let Vietnam become independent and self-determining. The U.S. was a neo-colonialist force. The framework was, of course, the Cold War and the American fear of a red tide taking over the world. But America's fierce anti-communism was based on something that America still refuses to acknowledge. That is that the goal of U.S. international policy has been, and still is, global hegemony that's in the service of multinational corporations and the military-industrial complex. If that sounds overstated, remember, and this is all in the post-World War II period, the, U the key role that the U.S. played in the overthrow of democratic governments in Iran, Guatemala, and Chile and the invasion of numerous countries. At one point when I first worked for CALC in the mid-1970s, the U.S. was supporting 50 military dictatorships around the world. 50. That was a little bit more than we could handle, so we focused on what we called the dirty dozen. <coughs> in the U.S., in the 80s, the U.S. orchestrated the Contra War, paid for the Contra War um, in Nicaragua, and also was involved militarily with dictatorships in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras. It's not ancient history, and the drive for global hegemony still continues. And I think it should be noted that those countries which have suffered U.S. intervention have something in common, and that is that the people in those countries are not people perceived in this country as white. I think there's a fundamental racism to U.S. foreign policy, just as there is to American society. So let's not talk about mistakes and misunderstandings, and let's not justify policies as arising from good intentions. And so let's not speak about reconciliation and healing until there's an admission of intentional aggression and until there's a change in direction. Now let me drop back to some of my own experiences during the Vietnam War and see if I can share some of what maybe I learned during that time that could relate to the situation today. Resisting the Vietnam War for me, as for many others, dominated a decade of my life. Though I was a graduate student when I first began opposing the war, most of my involvement was as a community member, a woman, and then as a mother. As a mother, I tended to identify with the mothers of Vietnam, and I really couldn't imagine that they loved their children any less fiercely than I loved my own. I also never felt separate from or alienated from people who were in the military service. In fact, I had three brothers-in-law who served in three branches of the armed forces. Early on when I lived in the Bay Area, we were leafleting in West Oakland in preparation for a march through that basically African-American neighborhood on our way to the Oakland Army Terminal. We thought we should let people know who we were and what we were planning to be doing. And outside a convenience store, we ran into a couple of, we were three young white women, and we ran into a couple of young African-American men outside this convenience store, and they were at first pretty disposed to be hostile toward us. But then something interesting happened, which is we began to ask them, where were you? How was it for you? We asked them questions. We cared about what they said. We listened. And very quickly, they were no longer the least bit hostile toward us. I think that was an important learning right there that, of course, we all know listening is always good. And 
the time is always right to recognize and affirm the humanity of other people and to help people see one another's humanity. And that's why I so appreciated the work that Don Luce did with the Indochina Mobile Education Project during the war, where he brought us um, a message from the Vietnamese people among whom he'd lived. And the message from them to us was, tell them we are people. He had a film strip, that was the technology of the time, that, was, that bore that title. And he also brought us Vietnamese poetry, Vietnamese food, phot photographs of people from in Vietnam, not the atrocity pictures, but just lovely pictures of, of people. We learned that from him, and the groups that I worked with, which included Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and also Medical Aid for Indochina, took a leaf from his book, and we also did photography exhibits and poetry readings. We included music in our events, and we tried to use the creative arts to touch people on a human level. And that's what Calc has been doing ever since. In fact, I bet you Michael Kerrigan's here somewhere with flyers, but there's um, there's a play that we're sponsoring this week and next called uh, Now I Am Your Neighbor, which tells the stories of immigrants living in Lane County at a time when there's an anti-immigrant sentiment in our country. So I encourage you to come to that if you haven't seen it. During the war, we employed all the organizing tactics you can think of, marches, rallies, vigils, leafleting. My two older kids grew up on the downtown mall during the weekly vigils that we had. Didn't hurt them. Um, <laughs> press conferences, teachers, speak, speak, speakers, films. We did some more creative things too, like a die-in outside of Congressman Dellenbach's re-election office. And then we arrested the mayor and Wixbeal, who was a prominent member of the city council, right during the middle of a city council meeting. <laughs> so why did we do that? We did that because they'd both spoken against the war. And under the two regime, under the decree laws of the two regime, which the U.S. was supporting at that time, they would have ended up in jail, maybe in the tiger cage prisons of the two regimes, simply for speaking out against the war. And we were trying to make that point. We did that with Vietnam Veterans Against the War. That was a joint effort from, from the two organizations. And we did a lot of things with veterans. We saw ourselves as being in solidarity with veterans, never as opposed to veterans. I learned something else important during the Vietnam War years, and it came out of a realization that the war wasn't an aberration, but it was integral to U.S. policy and the U.S. role as the world's policeman in the service of U.S. interests. That meant the struggle wasn't only about ending the war in Vietnam. The struggle for just and non-militaristic policies for social justice at home, too, was going to be a lifetime struggle. Paradoxically, that was a liberating realization. Be if, if in one way or another I was going to be standing in opposition to my government's policies probably for the rest of my life, that meant I needed to be, do it in a way that allowed me to be somewhat sane and healthy. That meant I needed to have some balance in my life so that I could sustain a commitment for the long haul. And that meant it was more than okay to take a walk, go for a swim, hang out with friends, take a vacation, grow a garden. It doesn't, and, and it does, it's a, yeah, sometimes it gets out of whack. It doesn't always stay well balanced, but I try. Um, and it, I think, does explain why I've never burned out and why at the age of 78, I'm still very much engaged. I want to add, of course, one more thing that sustains me, and that's the camaraderie of other people who are also involved in the struggle. I think I've had the privilege of working with some of the finest people on the whole planet. And we've had a lot of fun along the way. I think it's okay to have fun in the middle of serious struggles. In fact, it's essential. And if you ever find yourself in a group where nobody ever laughs, that's a toxic environment and you should get out of it. <laughs> After that comment about laughter, though, I need to end on a somber note, and that's that Two years ago, Calc and Vets for Peace together published a special insert in the Eugene Weekly, which we entitled Veterans Voices. Since then, several of the vets we worked with have passed on, and that followed losses that we sustained earlier. So I want to end by calling the names of Adrian Valor, who was a life member of the VVAW and always played taps at the cemetery on Memorial Day, 
of David Butler, who went back to Vietnam to aid in reconstruction there and also did a program for years on KRVM, of, of Ron Phillips, who tried to join the Waco Pol Texas Police Department after serving and being wounded as a Marine in Vietnam and was told he was too young to carry a gun. <laughs> Ron shared his war experience and his poetry with hundreds, maybe even thousands, of high school students as his way of preventing the same thing from happening again. And I call the name of my brother-in-law, Bill Barnes, also a combat Marine. Bill got a master's in gerontology from the University of Oregon, but he died, I think, from the unresolved anguish of the war, although the medical determination probably mentioned alcoholism. His name ought to be on the Vietnam Wall, along with thousands of others who died much too young after their service in Vietnam. To honor their memory and to honor the young soldiers who've died in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, who even knew we were in Niger, Niger, how do you pronounce it? Um, and elsewhere, American war making that is fueled, I think, by arrogance and greed and lies has got to stop, and we have to do our part to make it stop. My name is Bruce Hendricks. On the Calc website, I'm listed as TBA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, I was drafted into the Army in 1970. And in a blink, um, I completed basic and advanced infantry training and arrived in Vietnam. The rumors on the plane flying over were going from one extreme to the other. Some people were saying that as an infantry soldier, you had about a 14-day life expectancy. Others were saying, it's not so bad, just keep your head down and you'll be all right. We started to land in what was supposed to be a very safe and secure rear area. We were still on a commercial airline. All of a sudden, the plane went into a steep climb. The airstrip was being mortared. I was then quite sure that the 14-day life expectancy thing was the truth. Um, I was assigned to an infantry platoon with the 101st Airborne. A platoon was in my area was 12 to 14 men. A chopper flew me out to a fire base to join up with the platoon. We walked off the fire base into the jungle. We stayed in the jungle for four and a half months. No fire base, no rear area, just jungle. They finally gave us a three day stand down in the rear. We got two days and were sent back into the jungle. But I'm not here to tell war stories. Suffice it to say that my 12 months in Nam were madness. Human beings stalking human beings in the jungle, killing each other on sight. When I was drafted, I knew that I personally didn't want to go. But I remember thinking and saying, if North Vietnam is invading South Vietnam, and they've asked our country to help, and, and my country's agreed to help, well, then I'll, I'll go help. Unfortunately, what was probably the most selfless, noble intention of my life ended up serving a fiction. At one point, my platoon was, with, was within two clicks, that's two kilometers of the DMZ, which is the arbitrary line dividing North and South Vietnam. But even being this far north, I was still fighting Viet Cong. Viet Cong are South Vietnamese. I never even saw a North Vietnamese soldier. This is when I started to realize that we had all been lied to. A couple of years ago, some of us local vets staged an event in memory of the 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. We dropped a sunflower seed every 12 inches. 
Each seed represented one of the 58,183 Americans killed in Vietnam. We dropped a seed every 12 inches from 52nd and Willamette to the city of Coburg. A seed every 12 inches for over 11 miles. I felt that this helped people to better understand the reality of 58,183, that it's not just some big number. If we had included a seed for every Vietnam Vietnamese killed, the trail would have extended to the Canadian border. I believe one of the most powerful things we can do for peace is to more fully understand the true cost of war. You may or not, may not know of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Vietnamese Buddhist monk that was exiled from Vietnam in 1966. Because he was calling for peace, he was considered a subversive by both the North and the South. Thich Nhat Hanh posed this question. What if, what if, what if instead of waging war, the United States would have spent the same time, money, energy, and resources to help rebuild North and South Vietnam after the French were driven out? What if we had helped rebuild schools and roads and hospitals? The North and South would have gladly accepted the help as long as it was given freely and they would have become great friends and allies of the United States, and no one would have had to die. It's been 45 years since I fought in Vietnam, and to this day I deal with a deep wound in my soul, or my psyche. They call it PTSD, but that is just a fancy term for losing trust in my own humanity, and humanity as a whole. The saddest part of this PTSD story is that it doesn't change. I've spoken to Iraq and Afghanistan vets that suffer the same as me, and the same as vets from past wars that were diagnosed with shell shock or battle fatigue or maybe just labeled alcoholics. I believe one of the greatest obstacles to peace is that we don't believe it's possible. If we can't imagine it, we cannot create it. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, this sort of reminds me of the, I'm a beekeeper and we have a bee club. And uh, we had a, uh, somebody come over from the university who wanted to talk to the old timers. And I said to her, she was just an 18-year-old student, I said, I'm really sorry you missed them. They all passed away. <laughs> and uh, somebody looked at me and said, Chuck, have you looked in the mirror recently? <laughs> um, so it's uh, kind of hard to believe. I also had no idea. I, did, I thought we were going to say hello to each other and then leave because nobody was going to be here. Um, so I'm really kind of amazed and uh, very touched by all of you and incredibly proud to be on this panel with these folks. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, who I've known, many of uh, whom I've known for a long time. There's a number of ways that you can critique um, the Burns and Novak film. And if you want to read a wonderful critique, Robert Freeman does a wonderful job on um, uh, Common Dreams website. You can find it. What he basically says is that uh, the film is a mosaic, which is very close, but it never gets back so that you can see the whole picture. It fails to do that, and I think that's true. Uh, I recommend that reading to any of you. It's, it's really, there's a lot of other things on there, but that's, that's excellent. I wanted to mention just two things and then a, a memory. 
Um, the first is that uh, Novak and uh, Burns don't really deal with the anti-war movement. Uh, implicitly, you see anti-war uh, activists who are veterans and soldiers. And that's certainly a key element of the anti-war movement of the 1960s and 70s. Um, the anti-war movement within the military was unbelievably strong. It was also backed up by hundreds of coffee houses outside of every uh, single base. Um, it was also uh, very evident. Uh, I have friends who came back from Vietnam and went to Fort Lewis, and they used to have to separate Fort Lewis into the guys coming back who were never allowed to associate with the guys who were going over uh, because they knew uh, that if that association occurred, they'd have even more trouble uh, than uh, they had anyway. So I watched Zimmerman um, talk about how uh, in, the, I think, the first episode, um, anti-war activity became um, very prevalent on campus because um, people were going to get drafted. And I thought, wow, this guy has never talked to the hundreds and thousands of men who gave up their draft deferments, gave up their cards, burned them, sent them back, resisted the draft by refusing to have student deferments. And I knew lots of them. And I watched them um, burn their cards in Sheep's Meadow, uh, on the mall at the University of Wisconsin. Um, somehow Zimmerman never mentions these. Um, he never mentions the peace and social justice movements <clears throat> in the churches and amongst religious people. He does mention um, the student uh, anti-war movement, but often that's to tell us about the students who got killed at Kent State or to tell us about the people who I resisted in SDS and fought against at Wisconsin. Sometime, if you'd like to know the name of our pamphlets, I'll tell you, but I don't think I can say it on the air. But um, the weathermen uh, who were uh, sort of hijacking a movement um, and uh, decided that uh, blowing people up was, was the best strategy. I remember saying to them, at one point, I was in, in Montana going on a backpack, and I looked up at they had the FBI 10 most wanted list, and three of them were former roommates of mine. It was a dis disconcerting experience. Um, but I remember telling some of these guys, so you're going to go into a competition with the US government to see who can do more violence. Do you actually think you're going to win that? And um, it's the same thing I say to the SDS weathermen that I meet today, uh, exactly that same thing. So Burns and Novak uh, really don't look at the anti-war movement. And that's not an idle omission. It's an absolute essential part of that 1960s, 70s Vietnam experience. And to overlook it is to leave out, even in their mosaic, huge pieces of that mosaic. Um, and it's particularly irritating to see the closing sequence and to hear a, a woman talk about um, essentially uh, how terribly she treated, I'm really sorry she did, uh, the rest of us didn't, how terribly she treated veterans. Veterans were revered at Wisconsin they were valued because of their experience. And um, I listened to many stories. None move me more. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do this at my old age. None move me more than Mike's today, who is a dear friend of many years. Um, the idea that we spit on vets. I'd never even heard that until the 1990s and the Gulf War. And George H.W. tried to promote that idea. Spit on vets? Are you kidding me? That's insane. 
That's crazy. I was in the anti-war movement for eight years in five or six different states. Never saw anything like that. Never. So I really, I really want to emphasize that. Then one other point I want to say, I think that we as a generation, and particularly our veterans, those who saw combat in Vietnam, uh, I am so proud of their refusal to be silent about PTSD. They have brought it to the fore. They have talked about it. They have finally spoken about soldier's heart which is what it was called during the Civil War, or shell shock, or combat fatigue. You can't ignore it anymore. It's, it's there, and our generation, our folks who went into combat did that, and it's pretty incredible. Um, my oldest son is a physician, worked in the VA. What I can tell you is that the, um, PTSD percentages are much higher in Vietnam or in um, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans than they were in Vietnam. And you can see why, if you watch the Burns and Novak series, only 20% of the uh, people who are in Vietnam actually go into combat. That's a much higher percentage now because all of those 80% uh, of what people were doing in Vietnam have been privatized. So if you meet a vet from Iraq or Afghanistan, they've almost always been in combat and they have a much higher likelihood of PTSD. Thanks. PTSD is caused not by whether you had a parade or not when you came home, not by whether your family was happy to see you and embraced you or didn't or had questions, not by all of that. PTSD is caused by the experience of combat. It's that simple. And the government does that to all of us when we go into combat. That's what I learned. That's what I think our generation, and particularly the veterans in our generation, taught this country what we've learned since then about Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'll close with a story, I have lots of them. My students at the university got very tired of them sometimes. <laughs> but in a month, it was actually six weeks after I graduated from high school, I was called up for a physical. And uh, at seven in the morning, showed up at the Wilmington, Delaware Armory, and 86 of us loaded on this bus. Uh, Billy, I'm thinking of you, he sat next to me uh, in the homeroom, and he's gone now, but uh, he stepped on a bouncing Betty in Vietnam and uh, came home in pretty rough shape. Uh, but we all got on that bus, and we went up to Philadelphia, and oh, man, running around in your underwear with a bag around your neck with a watch and, a, and a, your wallet in your bare feet. I still remember how cold that floor was, even in July. This was July 31st. And uh, we went through it all, got on the bus and headed home, and there was that sort of bravado of young men. And Bill was one of them talking about going to Vietnam and, and laughing about, you know, ah, we're going to die in Vietnam and all that stuff. And, and um, it was, I still, and I dream about it, it was a warm summer day. The sun was out and it was bright. And it wasn't freeway era. It was little side streets. And we had to get from Philadelphia back to Wilmington, and the bus driver didn't know. And we got lost. Mm -hmm. And so I still dream about it. 86 of us wandering around in this yellow school bus, <laughs> wandering about southern Pennsylvania. And uh, for some reason, I never dream we got home. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think we ever really did. Uh, after Vietnam, we never got home. That's dear to my heart. Uh, 
moral trauma is what post-traumatic stress is called now, and many veterans have experienced moral trauma. I spent my 21st birthday in an orthopedic ward of a naval hospital before I went to Vietnam, and uh, 34 guys, every one of them had a body part missing from Vietnam, and the 19-year-old Marine beside me had five parts missing, and he was dying from infection. And uh, it was two weeks of, of hell. And I went to Vietnam, thank God I was aboard ship, and I was there during the Tet Offensive, and I saw everything, and I knew what was happening there because of my time in the hospital. Never did I ever dream that I would have a son going to Iraq and Afghanistan. And what my wife and I went through was the anger issues I had, I didn't know how to deal with. And you know, the Bush doctrine, they're evil, we're good, God's on our side, let's go get them. So they taught our young men to kill in God's name. And right now my son's a right-wing military captain with Central Command, and I'm very proud of him. But uh, what we went through as a family with him in Iraq and Afghanistan, God put some of these people in my life because I was about ready to drink, start drinking again, and I didn't want to do that. But thanks to Jim, and Mike, and Carol, and our other vet friends, I, I made it. And I'm grateful to be here. So, um, I'm a veteran myself. Uh, Vietnam was the war of my childhood and the war of my youth. And I've been thinking about this a lot since the Burns and Novak film. One of the questions I had asked a couple weeks ago was, how do I know what's true? I was a kid. I have real concerns today. We have kids that have grown up with these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. These are the wars of their childhood and their youth. And I feel like the military is glorified. And our youth are not told the truth by recruiters about what happens in war. My, my question is, what is our responsibility and what do we need to do so that this continued glorification doesn't happen, so people know the truth, and in particular, our young people know the truth. And what is our responsibility as veterans? So I don't know who can answer the app, uh, but that's my deep concern, and that's my question. So does anybody? <laughs> My name is Jack Rady. I was drafted in 1966. I reported for induction in Fresno, California, which was unfortunate. Um, all the other guys in the place were eager to go airborne, kill some commies. And I, when I was called forward, I said, no, sir, <clears throat> not going. And they said, okay, son, you know, you just calm down and we'll get everybody else out to the bus and get another chance. Just you and me, okay, son? Yes, sir. And once again, I said, no. Most of those guys finished their year in training and were over in Vietnam for 1967 in the big divisional war. I know a lot of them didn't make it. One thing I want to pass on, Dave McReynolds went to North Vietnam um, is one of the first American, not the first American delegation, but one of the first. And he had a meeting with Ho Chi Minh. And Ho began the meeting by saying, before we say anything else, I want to express to you 
my deep appreciation for the young Americans who are coming to my country under the impression that they are here to do something good for the Vietnamese people. That's not what they're doing, but that's what is in their hearts, and I know it, and I have to express my respect for that. I want to say two things about soldiers. First, the soldiers that we arm, equip, and put out in the field. You will know, I'm a military historian, and you will notice some similarities between the Royal Laotian Army of 1961, you're all about my age, you remember that? When the Royal Laotian Army suddenly dissolved and ran over the border into Thailand, um, the Thais confiscated all their weapons and sent them back again and we rearmed them. In Laos, in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in El Salvador, place after place after place, the United States sets up a government, claims it is democratic, there was no South Vietnamese government. We established that. We sent the guy over to head it. We ran the election. There would, there would have been one Vietnam, as there was supposed to be after the agreement with the French was made. We sabotaged that. The whole thing was artificial from the beginning. But none of these armies, they all have the same characteristic. They're terrible at ambush tactics. They make noise in the field to reveal their presence, to make sure they don't make contact. Their officers steal the men's pay. Their higher officers take yet a bigger cut. And somehow, even though they outnumber, outgun, have American air support, and are fighting people poorly armed, weaker, smaller, lacking every kind of technology, and they get torn a whole new asshole. I'm scary. Television. All right. They get torn a whole new aperture. Um, and this happens over and over again. We can't understand why is there such a high desertion rate. And the people they're fighting, the local guerrillas, are from the same farm kids that make up the draftees that we put in our puppet army. And yet they fight with enormous morale. They put up with B-52 strikes, and they don't desert. And they win. We've been in Afghanistan 15 years. We've had all that time to build up an army. And if the United States pulled out tomorrow, the government that we support would be gone. And everyone knows that. We keep doing the same thing over and over again. What is it we do? We set up a government. We arm some people there. And we say, OK, control all the rest of them so it stays a country friendly to the United States. Except the people there would rather just be their own country. And in each case, when it's over, the Vietnamese will be in Vietnam, the Laotians will be in Laos, the Afghans will be ruling Afghanistan, the Iraqis will be ruling Iraq, and we'll be gone eventually. Why don't we just cut to the chase and save a whole lot of lives and money? Yeah. <laughs> okay, the second thing is about American soldiers. And all the things that are said about the respect the anti-war movement had for the veterans is true. And for those troops who were on active duty and were active in the anti-war movement. Three American aircraft carriers were put out of commission by sailors throwing wrenches into the reduction gears. Every American infantry division in Vietnam had an underground newspaper. Has that ever happened in American military history before? I can tell you, no. Finally, how did the war end? And I'll bet, I don't have a television, but I'll bet this was not in the documentary. A job action by American Air Force and Naval personnel refusing to continue the bombing of North Vietnam. It is well covered, but I've been to the Air Force Academy and done some research, and I've talked to a lot of veterans. My job used to be listening to veteran interviews. And they all acknowledge, yeah, well, yeah, you know, and the deal was they don't say anything, and no one gets court-martialed. But in fact, the U.S., when it began bombing Hanoi, there had been four issues in contention at the peace talks. The Vietnamese had conceded on two, and the Americans insisted they concede on the other two. At the end of the bombing, the Americans signed the agreement. Not one concession had been made by the Vietnamese. It, what stopped the bombing was the refusal of the air crews to fly. At the end of the Vietnam War, the Nixon government was pretty sure they did not have enough troops to maintain the government in Washington if things went sideways here, because the army was breaking up in their hands and they knew it. 
that's why they got rid of the draft. I don't think we can do that with the current army, but I think it's worth a try. My name is uh, Todd Boyle, and uh, I disserved my country from 1970 to 72, and I've been with Vets for Peace since 2003 during the Iraq War era. And uh, I stood 500 sh uh, shifts on overpasses with U.S. out of Iraq and U.S. out of Afghanistan between 2003 and 2010. But I just wanted to make one point that uh, we came here today to uh, ask about what are, what are we doing different and what can we do different. And what I believe is that we, we aren't doing enough different and that nothing has substantially changed. So the United States has invaded uh, Korea, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf in a series of wars since World War II. And none of the wars since at least World War II have been self-defense, as you all know. No Vietnamese ever came and attacked us here, no Koreans. And so uh, I'll just offer my suggestion of what we have to do different. Because I've heard today that we entered Vietnam or the United States started these wars and it wasn't the United States that started these wars. And it wasn't America, and it wasn't us. It was them. And the, it's a well-documented historical fact, the political actors and the e economic and financial actors who were policymakers and in position of authority that formed the policy to invade Vietnam and Iraq and so on. And it's all a matter of historical record and that the American people were not on board this most of them didn't even know what it was about, and nor do they know today what it's about if we have a war in Iran or in uh, Africa or in uh, Central America again. So the key that I'd like to suggest is it's not we who are waging these wars, and stop saying we, and stop saying the United States. It's those guys, the war people, okay? Thank you. I'm interested in any thoughts people have about um, how we can do things differently, what it would take, what needs to happen. Um, hey, Ron, you want to come up? I don't know. <laughs> and part of that, how do we get younger people involved? I don't really know. I love great turnout in this room. I don't think there's anyone under 50. <laughs> so how can we also think about reach out to the generations behind us to get them involved as well? Um. Well, the answer to the question, I'm not a, a veteran who served in Vietnam, a veteran who served during Vietnam, but um, that being said, um, uh, well, what we basically have is history repeating itself about every two generations, about every 40 years. And it's been going on. So, so anyway, I guess what we need to do is either. Now you can talk. Okay. So I guess what I would say is, I mean, and, M and Michael can either back this up or tell me I'm full of it. But um. You're never. Okay. Well, the thing is, if we basically wait 40 years, we can just pretty much throw a generation of our young people away. It's, you know, so we just basically might as well tell them, um, our, our kids are, who become adults and have kids that, hey, when your kids get to be 20 years old, you know, kiss them goodbye because they're not coming back. Because every 40 years we do this over again. So I guess the, the education in the schools needs to change. We need to tell the truth. Uh, in other words, we have, need to have books that tell the truth about what actually war is and quit glorifying it. I mean, the John Wayne, I remember the John Wayne movies, you know, how, how everything was glorified. I remember the Westerns always glorified the cowboys. When I was growing up, I hated it. So what about the Indians? What, did they deserve that? No. But the point is, it repeats itself because we perpetuate its repetition uh, through our... Um, or media, through the books that we give our kids to read, and all these other things. So I think we need to change our education. We need to um, get down to the nitty gritty. I guess a good example was, you remember when uh, uh, people dying due to uh, uh, automobile accidents and young people dying and they had this terrible, they showed these terrible movies of people all crunched up together in a, in a, in a car. 
right? And how, how that affected people, you know, <laughs> that, that's what we need to do. We need to show people in their worst condition and say, this is us. This is our dehumanizing attempt at saying that war is justifiable. Let me say just one quick thing to that, which is that we aren't the only people that did or didn't learn lessons. So did the government. And one major lesson they learned is don't let wars into American living rooms on TVs. Yeah. And so we saw some of what we saw in that Burns Novick thing. We saw it at the time in everybody's yeah. living room. And we sure didn't see it with uh, embedded journalists in Iraq. And we don't have any visual sense of what's going on in Afghanistan or to the people of Afghanistan. And that's a big, big lack because it makes it that much harder to recognize their humanity. <sighs> I, I just want to say that we can do uh, what I'm doing by being here today, and that is educate ourselves before we start to, to reach out totally, but we can be reaching out even before we have what we think we know totally. Um, the documentary by uh, Burns and Novick um, was transformational in my life like no other event has ever transformed me. And that's why I'm here today. And um, we can do things like, and I see my friend Reza back there, writing op-eds, writing letters to the editor. Reza had an op-ed yesterday that I put in a file that I started uh, right recently, not right after the documentary, but recently, um, of everything that's war-related, that's educational, and, and resonates with me. And um, um, so we can, we, can, we can write, the pen is mightier than the sword, and we can learn, and we can learn, and we can learn, and we'll never know too much, but we'll learn enough so that we can stop wars, because war is not an answer. It simply ends in destruction. Um, one of the things Byrne said about his uh, documentary is he couldn't cover everything. We had the same experience um, that we couldn't cover everything. And I realized that that is a major exception, that we don't have a Vietnamese perspective. We also haven't really talked about the racism, um, except my, Marion did a little bit, but uh, there's some other topics. Well, I've got my hand on the, on the microphone. I wanted to read a quote, and this comes from um, a thing that's online by a man named Daniel May, How to Revive the Peace Movement in the Trump Era. And he says, it's hard to imagine a more difficult target from an organizing perspective than military policy. The US empire today leaves a great deal of ruin in its wake, but its cost is only vaguely felt by Americans. While its ginormous profits are pocketed by a few, and, uh, and the most recognized organization, the military itself, is widely celebrated as the most trusted public institution. I, that, that quote really stuck out to me about what, how difficult the task ahead for us is. There are some ideas that are presented here, and informing ourselves is certainly one of them, and that's speaking out. Um, about the truth. Um, but the same author went on with an idea about an approach, because I think no one in this room will be surprised to know, uh, to note that the peace movement is not very vibrant at this point. We're mostly the people in this room, old and white. Um, and so his thought about that is that in reality, all of the major social problems we have right now from um, climate issues to racism, prejudice against immigrants, um, needs for in infrastructure, um, all, all of these problems that militarism, militarization of our culture underlies 
is an underlying cause. And I think in some of those, it's very obvious. I mean, the military is the largest uh, carbon footprint of any institution in the world. Some of these things, it's really easy to see how really that we need to deal with militarism. Uh, we can't deal with climate change, uh, climate issues without doing something about the, uh, the horrible uh, pollution of the military. And so some of these things, it's um, easier to see how that's true, but the more I think about it, I think that might be a potential direction for us to begin organizing around uh, just how militarization is, how pervasive it is in our culture. How can we stop them from brainwashing our young people? Yeah. After my wife and I realized that our son wasn't the same person after he came back from officer's training, uh, we realized he was brainwashed in, in a way that we, we still don't understand how, how it happened. But it did, and that's what they do. They brainwash these, especially the officers. Um, we're talking about a lot of similarities uh, between then and now. Um, I guess one of the things I find most fascinating, I just want to point out two similarities. Um, Kellyanne Conway is rightly credited with having uh, created the term alternative facts. And um, in our household, alternative facts are, are kind of looked at in kind of amazement. Um, but we need to realize that alternative facts um, Gulf of Tonkin incident? That was an alternative fact. Yep. Um, the body counts and all the victorious battles were all the alternative facts. In fact, the Friday night uh, Armed Forces um, news person's reviews were known as the Friday night follies by the newsmen and the journalists. These were all alternative facts. Alternative facts are not new. Um, I finally actually got on tape at the university one time uh, in the early um, days of the George W. invasion of, of Iraq, saying that there were no weapons of mass destruction. That was obvious. And I'm so pleased with that because I'm finally on tape saying it way before that became clearly an alternative fact. Um, all of these alternative facts are really amazing and they get pushed in the society and we need to resist those. Uh, one other thing that I think of that we're doing in Viet that we did in Vietnam that we're doing now is, is what I call asymmetrical wars. And that is we go into a third world country with this enormous firepower. And if you listen to the Burns and Novak series, uh, the Vietnamese tell you one way to survive. It's called the belt strategy. You grab a hold of their belt and pull them close to you so that the um, U.S. firepower can't kill you uh, because they're afraid of killing their own people. So you make sure and pull them close and hold on to their belt. Um, that's the way you fight it. Well, we're still fighting those kinds of battles. And in those kinds of asymmetrical third world battles, your presence generates your opposition. And you can see that in the Burns and Novak series. Um, what really infuriates the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese is the American presence, the French presence. Get out of here, leave us alone, and um, we'll be fine. But your presence will create the resistance and eventually creates the army. That's also true contemporarily. Um, the other reason why these things go on forever, uh, and by the way, Afghanistan is not the longest war in U.S. history. I remember Mike saying that at a gather at a meeting we were at, and I, I said, yeah, I'm really offended by that. Um, uh, you know, Vietnam is. Um, but the reason it goes on forever is not just that you generate your opposition, but also to survive, merely to survive and stay in the field is all that the, op that the uh, South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese needed to do. They don't have to win. All they have to do is survive and stay alive and resist. 
the United States must go in and win totally. And those two very different requirements to end the war um, mean that the war just goes on forever. You generate your own opposition. All they have to do is stay there and survive your firepower, and you can't win. And so you just keep sending in more troops, generating more opposition, and on and on it goes. And that was true in Vietnam. I think it's true in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's true in, in a number of other places. Um, so uh, we need to change that. We need to stop that asymmetrical war. We need to stop that uh, attempted domination. Okay. Um, my name is Jim Schmidt. Oh, oh, can't sit there. Can't sit there. Um, once, once upon a time in the, once upon a time in, yeah, it does. In the Calc um, office, I was there with Michael and Carol and maybe Mike and a few others, and we had a young uh, aide in from uh, Peter DeFazio's office, and she was basically there. I think I have socks older than she was. Um, <clears throat> she was basically there to give us a little pep talk and to. Uh, tell us the truth as she understood it. And um, so I put the question to her. I said, listen, we're, I've forgotten her name. I said, listen, we're, uh, we're out here on the front lines and we're fighting with a, a set of tools in a toolbox that just has been demonstrated not to work. It, 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 it isn't working. And... I said, what are we going to do? And she implied that we weren't working hard enough. And um, not necessarily to my credit, but I lost my temper with her. And I told her that I'd been on the front lines for three times as long as she'd been alive. And I did not appreciate being told that I wasn't working hard enough. But I'm asking you the same question. Um, what tools do we have to effectively make this work? I mean, we're doing we're doing um, we're doing TIR, uh, Truth and Recruiting. Uh, Carol, uh, you can't say enough about what Carol does in TIR. But look at how badly we're outnumbered. We're outnumbered billions to one. Every single video game probably has more impact than Truth and Recruiting can possibly have. Movies glorify the violence. The, the, it is pervasive for, for kids growing up, absolutely. It's stamped into their DNA. What we need to change is so fundamental, and we don't have the tools to do it. And I hate to be the guy who's turning the fire sprinklers on you all and, and wetting you all down, but that's the, that's the God's honest truth. We do not have the tools to fight the monster that's been created. And the monster has the edge. The monster made mistakes during Vietnam, and it knows it. The draft, big mistake. Get rid of the draft. That, that's, that puts malcontents like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like Bruce and me, puts us into the, into the white. Would you have ever heard of me lie without malcontent draftees? Probably not. Get, make the press into lap dogs instead of attack dogs. Point number two, embed very friendly journalists into the, into the frontline troops and make sure that they don't see the whole truth and that what they do see they report favorably. Control the press, control the numbers, cut the numbers of, of, of people who are contributing to the military down into the 1% area and make them feel elite and special and you've created a sit the situation we are in today. And so if anybody has an idea that, that, that we haven't tried, I mean, we can march on street corners, we can wave signs, we can write letters, we can do, I've done all those things and I've sung songs and beaten on drums and you know, I didn't stop the war and stuff. So that's what we need tonight. I, 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 I hate to put it so bluntly and so skeptically because I'm, I, I'm resigned to the fact that I'm the most skeptical person in any room and it doesn't matter who else is in that room. I am pessimistic and I am skeptical and we need to address our shortcomings not in a sense of reinforcing each other and what we've been doing and how well we've been doing it, but in the sense of what's not working 
And we are in a society that's addicted to war right now. And we need to admit that to ourselves and figure out how to change it. The toolbox, the toolbox is obsolete. I welcome comments. This is my grandfather's watch. Uh, I think it's twice as old as I am. I'm 24. Uh, he died two months ago, and he fought in the Korean War, not the Vietnam War, but the Korean War. I didn't fight in any war. I'm part of a generation that, that actively seeks out war. Every single night, we go and turn on an Xbox, and we'll, the more violent, the more realistic, the more gory, the more we'll pay for it. And then at the end of the night, we'll turn off that war and then we'll go to sleep, but that's not how war works, from what I've heard. Um, and we don't know what it's like afterwards. Unlike this generation, we haven't lived through a war, we haven't experienced it. None of my friends have been drafted. None of my friends have died in combat. Um, I don't know any amputees from a foreign conflict. But um, I do know my generation. As a millennial, I'm, I think, the most connected generation ever. We have more cameras on our phone than they did 50 years ago in a studio. We can send messages to literally anybody and reach tens of thousands of people, but I don't think we're reaching the right people. And I don't think my generation has the answer. And I don't think this generation has the answer either, but I think we both have a piece of the answer, but only once we can connect with each other on that are we going to really be able to move forward. So as a filmmaker, um, I'm trying, and I think that's part of the answer is to move forward and actually tell those stories and to actually connect in a way we both can understand and move forward. But you're very right. There's, there's a million pieces to this puzzle. And I think it's just trying to put each one together right. In response to the question of what we can, uh, what we can do, there are things we can do. And uh, of course, there's the, the campus Marxists have a theory of power of what has to be done. And that's, we're all, probably some of us are familiar with that, with what they believe has to be done. Uh, anarchists have another theory of, of power. And uh, I think that it, what it does center on is you have to have a theory of power of who you think is causing the wars. And uh, of course, my theory of power is that the uh, thing in New York and Washington, D.C. is really a merged uh, entity of financial power and the governmental power and corporations. And uh, it's not really the United States as shown in the, in, in the Constitution. But what's actually happening is that the, the uh, system is controlled by donations to campaigns and control of the media and so on and so forth. Having uh, studied this thing for a few years, I have come to the conclusion, and I just offer this freely, the thing in New York and Washington, D.C., which controls our national our laws because they have sovereign power in our country, is not going to reform itself to, uh, around the issue of war and some other central issues like control of the monetary system and so forth. They are not going to reform or change. And so that if war, if ending war is your priority, which it is for me, and I don't have any more issues about uh, in distribution of wealth or so on or the, or the uh, environment, I just don't want war and I'm not going to put up with it, then I really have only one place to go, and that is that uh, the United States has to be abolished and that we have to start talking about the idea of what would succeed the United States and how that could happen nonviolently and in a practical adult way as it's being done in Scotland and other parts of the world. And uh, so what we would do if we face the fact that the New York Washington power system is actually not going to stop having wars and it's actually continue the same things, then we would be forced to face the fact that we have to talk about abolishing the United States in a nonviolent, practical way over a nice 10 or 20 year period. And the key thing that's holding back that from ever happening, first of all, it's unthinkable, and you can't get people to actually think about it, but it is actually doable. It's actually doable over, over a period of time. I was a CPA for 25 years, and it's amazing what corporations do by having a budget process. There's no conflict or argument. They just say, okay, well, how far ahead do we shut down this plant? Okay, we shut it down, we pinch off the supplies, we just, you know, we do it in an orderly way. Everybody's happy. Nobody gets hurt. And that's what they did in the Hong Kong handover. And we've seen this over and over in our lifetime. It can happen. In our country, we need a nationwide discussion and a movement so that we don't have one state trying to secede and everybody else sending the troops. We have to have a united vision around this so that there isn't a war and that we just say, look, the thing in New York and Washington is not working for us anymore. And we just want to build some regional countries. And how that happens is we start having rooms full of people, 
talk seriously about what the Constitution should look like that would work better, that would never do this again, and address some other problems that whoever, and this isn't about left and right. The room is going to be full of business people and God knows who all, and I don't care what they do as long as we don't have these wars, because that's really the only issue I have. I just uh, want to make uh, just a quick comment. Um, I think the room proves that Vietnam was our issue. It was our experience and our issue, and uh, I think you said it dominated 10 years of your life. It uh, dominated at least 10 years of my life, and, and I, I said to my students at one point, um, that war is never over as long as I'm alive. Um, because that's, that's, and I didn't, I wasn't in the military, but it was 10 years of my life. That is not my experience with this generation. My experience with this generation is you need a different issue. Um, that as much as Vietnam is, is uh, and, and Iraq and Afghanistan as a consequence, very close to me, um, I think you need a different issue and I think it's environmentalism. Uh, these kids can't walk away from the environment. It's going to be their lives, and that's their issue. And um, you have to uh, begin to approach them on that issue. Um, their eyes will glaze over when you start talking about Vietnam many times. Um, at university, it, it's a whole other question. I could teach a whole bunch of history. I could teach a whole bunch of other things. The key was to cr uh, teach critical thinking. But um, Vietnam and war is not their issue. And it's evidenced by the room, uh, and it's evidenced, I think, by our experience. Look to their issue. Uh, try and find what their issue is, and that's where you'll find them. And I, personally, I think it's environmentalism, yeah. but I don't know. I uh, first want to say that I'm very opposed to public speaking. I'm not very good at it. but. Uh, <clears throat> I do have some uh, stuff to share. Uh, I am a combat Vietnam vet uh, in Vietnam 69 and 70. <clears throat> I uh, lived with, I've lived with uh, PTSD all of my life, undiagnosed, uh, all of my adult life anyway. And it was uh, finally diagnosed in 2011 after uh, December 2010. Uh, episode that just shook me to my core. Anyway, I suffer from the same results that, uh, you know, prior, prior to that time, I was, I knew that I had PTSD or something similar to it. Uh, I was very quick to anger, which I hadn't been in my youth before Vietnam. And, but I, I, I think I used that to my advantage a lot of times. Uh, Anyway, um, <clears throat> the, the, the returning vets that we have, they don't know that they have it until they, it strangles them, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and that's the way it was for me. I knew that there was something wrong. Something was changed in me. And actually, that's not entirely true. When I first got back, just like every other vet, I found out that all of my friends that I went to high school with and friends that I had, my parents and my brothers, and everybody, everybody had changed. They all had changed so much. And it took me years to realize that nobody had really changed. I had changed, but I saw the change in them. Anyway, and that's what's happening to our younger vets that are returning. And my heart just goes out to them. Um, I haven't heard anybody um, talk about war as business. Um, that's a big problem because there's so many industries that have evolved around war-related. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a big part of the problem that, that uh, you know, that can't stop the giant, so to speak. Anyway, uh, Chuck shared with me uh, an article in the New York Times. Uh, I only made it through the first paragraph. I'd like to read the rest. But it, uh, it was very hard hitting. 
it uh, identified uh, something that I researched many, many years ago. Uh, I googled uh, how many countries are on the planet. I forget the exact number, but it was, I'm just going to throw it out, 190 something uh, countries and territories on the planet. And the U.S. has military bases in 152, no, 172 of the 190 something. Is there something wrong with that? <laughs> I mean, another one that didn't uh, make it, uh, and I believe I first heard this on NPR, that uh, over the past 10 years, the U.S. military has spent $4.4 trillion on military, <coughs> military everything, I suppose. And most people can't conceptualize what a trillion dollars is. I know I couldn't. But the way that they put it was that if you were to spend a million dollars a day, every day since the birth of Christ, you would end up short of three quarters of one trillion dollars. And I think that pretty much nails it. That's where our military is right now. It's everything war and the hell with everything else, you know? I just want to say if there's people in this room that people have referenced TIR, Truth and Recruiting, but if there are people here who don't know about it, talk to uh, Carol or Shelley. Mike or Shelley to find out more about it because it is a program that Calc has been doing for a number of years that goes into every high school in Lane County and does talk to young people. And no, we don't have the resources that the military has, but it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It does matter. And then I also want to just pick up on what Chuck said about the environment being the way to get to young people and then the obvious connection with the, the, the military as the biggest polluter on the planet. And uh, along those lines, Calc works very closely with the 350 Eugene Group, which is really doing some cutting edge organizing on climate change in this community. So if you want to get involved with Calc and 350, give me a call at, at the Calc office. Also, I want to thank all the people in this room. I'm proud of the peace movement in the state. We've had a real impact. Our senators, our, the uh, Congress people in the state pretty much support peace. It's because people are, have been active in this room and others. So. I think we have a lot, a lot to be proud of. And what, I'm also, what we're also proud of is our community, is our county. Uh, we have a very uh, diverse county now. And Calc has worked with the, the, the uh, uh, immigrant uh, folks in our county for many, many years. And we have an upcoming play called now, now I Am Your Neighbor, a play telling stories shared by the uh, immigrants who live here in Lane County. It's a very, very positive story. It's a very uplifting e evening so urge you all to attend I, I apologize I forgot my little flyers I left them in my car so uh, but Wednesday October 5th which is coming up this week at the very little theater at, uh, at 730 huh I mean October 25th sorry uh, and that's uh, and also on Tuesday November 7th at the Oregon Contemporary Theater there's room uh, uh, to see both plays just give a call to Calc and we can reserve a ticket for you. Because it's important to stress the positive in this community, the positive in, in their lives, but also learn the lessons from Vietnam. And I just really, the speakers are just wonderful tonight. Let's, let's thank them for their wonderful contribution to our evening. <laughs>